For today's EMN5, I want to talk about increased intracranial pressure and trauma. We get head traumas a lot coming into the ER. Um, it's usually kind of a rush to get neurosurgery on the phone, um, and I think it's easy to kind of forget some of our basic management that's really important to the patient's outcome in the ER. So I'm actually going to start off with the three to remember today, mostly because I want you to remember these numbers. For the vital signs, we got to remember the 90s. For the medications, it's the ones, and we'll explain all that as I come to it. So let's talk a little bit about the injuries that can cause increased intracranial pressure. So blunt injury is probably the most common. Um, that includes subarachnoid hemorrhage, epidural hemorrhage, obviously any kind of skull fracture, it can be at risk, um, intraventricular hemorrhage, diffuse axonal injury. Um, here's a little example of a patient I had with blunt head trauma, and you have a really nice example of that subdural hematoma here, um, nice crescent shape on the side. Penetrating injury, we probably end up treating a lot less, mostly because the mortality rate is so high. For a gunshot wound, it can reach about 50% mortality, and that actually increases if it crosses midline. And here's a picture of a patient I had their uh, CT scan. It was a gunshot wound to the back of the head. You can see it entering here, and it actually bounced off the inside of the skull and comes over, but it didn't quite cross midline. So there are two major things that we can do in the ER to prevent secondary injury to these patients who already have a pretty bad injury. The two things I want you to think about is what does the injured brain need? It needs oxygen and it needs perfusion, it needs blood. So as far as oxygen, we really need to prevent hypoxia. That means getting an airway right away, you need to make sure and optimize the O2. Our goal should be a saturation of above 90%. And I know that sounds kind of silly because of course we want to go above 90%. But here's why it's so important. If the saturation goes below 90% even one time, it increases the mortality by two. I just think that's incredible. So you just can't let them dip below 90%. Perfusion, blood, is just as important. So here we're thinking about preventing systemic hypotension. So our goal here is going to be a systolic blood pressure of above 90%. And here again, if it dips below 90% even once, that increases their mortality by three. It's just incredible. So we really need to make sure that we're optimizing our perfusion. Now you can't talk about brain injury without talking about the cushioning reflex, so let's just review it really quickly. So these three things are indicators of increased intracranial pressure. Number one, hypertension. Just think about that as the body's attempt to keep the mean arterial blood pressure greater than the ICP. Bradycardia is more of the, the vagal response, the crowded barrel receptors response to that increased intracranial pressure. And lastly, irregular breathing or even apnea, that's a really late finding. That's pressure on the brain stem. You're looking at impending herniation or death. So I know this is a really busy slide, but I just want to point out mostly the things here in red are what I want you to take away from it. So this is about management in the ER. So we already talked about airway. Um, your GCS is less than eight, or you think this person is in danger give them their airway. And while you're getting that airway, it's important to remember that lidocaine is something you should use for pretreatment um, in patients with head trauma. And the dosing for lidocaine is one milligram per kilogram IV. Now one thing we don't do anymore is hyperventilate the patients. We do want to prevent hypercapnia, so we want our goal to be, let's say, end title of CO2 of around 35. That's a really reasonable goal. You're making sure that you prevent hypercapnia, and at the same time you're not hyperventilating the patient and driving that CO2 really low. Other important things, elevate the head of bed, make sure our perfusion status is optimized. One other equation to point out here, mostly for board purposes, is the equation for cerebral perfusion pressure. So CPP is equal to the MAP minus the ICP. Um, and your goal is gonna be around 50 to 70. You're not really gonna be able to do this um, without an ICP monitor, but you can kind of uh, you know, think it through in your head. If you have a MAP of, say, 70, you have to keep that ICP below 20 or you're gonna have problems with that CPP being too low and now your brain is not perfused anymore. So that's just kind of a general way of thinking about it, keeping your MAPs high, ICPs low. The last two things I wanna mention quickly are the two treatment medications you should be thinking about giving these patients. Manitol, one gram per kilogram, Keppra, one gram IV. Those are the ones that I was talking about. Now for Manitol, remember the effect takes almost 30 minutes. And you're going to be giving it if you have evidence of herniation or any kind of decline in the neural status. Capra is one gram IV. You can also use phenytoin. That's a very acceptable alternative. This is more for prevention of early seizures, as in the first seven days. So the treatment dose, hopefully you give one in the ER, and then make sure and treat them for seven days after that. So 
three things to remember, which we already talked about before, are oxygen, we want to keep our sats greater than 90, get that airway right away, and for perfusion, our systolic blood pressure goal is going to be greater than 90. So our vital signs, remember, greater than 90s. Remember, your mortality increases times 2 to 3 if you let them go below the 90s. And for medications, mannitol 1 gram per kilogram and cupra 1 gram. These are important. Make sure and ask your neurologist or just go ahead and give it to the patient if you're concerned. And thanks for joining us on EMN5's Increased Intracranial Pressure in Traumatic Brain Injury.